Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May 2015 HHQI Cardio LAN webinar. We'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedules today to join us for this meeting. It's one of our special meetings each year that we really look forward to. It's when you have a chance to really hear from the people who are doing the work, like yourselves. These are the agencies who are inputting data and making changes to the cardiovascular plans in their agency, and it's a chance to have have the opportunity to share with each other and learn from each other of what's going on because we know all of this is new to everyone. So we thank you for taking the time to join us today. With us on the call today, we'll hear from later our agency representatives, which include Diane Arcello, Emily Smith, and Joy Owens. I'll introduce you a little bit more formally as we go along the, uh, through the session. From the HHQI side, we have Misty Kevich, who is an RM project coordinator, and we have Stacey Deslich, who is the health data analyst with us today. And for those of you I haven't met, my name is Cindy Sun, and I'm an RM project coordinator as well. So just a few little ideas of what's going on. This session is being recorded for those who are unable to make it to the session uh, for the live feed, and they want to be able to learn at a later date. All the lines are currently muted. We will be unmuting the lines if you are on the phone a little later in the call, so take this as a moment, if you don't mind, and mute your own lines so that we don't accidentally eavesdrop on your calls. We'll open them up for discussion and Q&A as we progress. For those of you that are watching on the computer and listening through the computer speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A option on the right-hand side of your screen and start sending your questions in. We want this to be an interactive session, but due to the volume, that's the reason we mute everything out, but we don't want to Welch, any opportunities that we all have to share. So with this today, the first thing we'll go ahead and do is turn everything over to Stacey Deslick, who will give us a little bit of information on the HHDDR news and information. Stacey? All righty. Well, thanks, Cindy, very much. And thank you and welcome to everyone who has joined us today for the webinar. Um, today's webinar promises to be really interesting and engaging, and I'm so excited to hear what the agencies are doing. It's a really great opportunity, I think, for all of you and for us to hear how things are going. So the registry closed on the 14th of the month, and the reports are ready. Um, new data be became available for abstraction on the 15th, and several agencies have already abstracted and submitted their data. So remember, last month, the CardioLAN webinar followed so closely after the registry closed, I didn't really have much data to share with you. So this month, I'll wrap both months into one update right now. So for both months, tobacco was the most abstracted measure, and it was followed closely by, by blood pressure and aspirin as appropriate. Cholesterol continues to be the least abstracted, but it's growing nonetheless. Now, the measure rates are holding steady, and we're really just on the edge of coming to the point where we'll hope to see some movement in a positive direction. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But first, some congratulations are in order. Fisher Titus Home Health Center in Norwalk, Ohio, was the first agency to close their data for January. And a special shout out goes to Allison Likens, RN, from Fisher Titus. According to her agency, the credit for the quick submission goes all to her. So great job, Allison, and congratulations, Fisher Titus Home Health Center in Norwalk, Ohio. Another congratulations goes out to Pekin Memorial Hospital Home Health in Pekin, Illinois, for being the first agency to close out the month of February. Your fast and accurate data submission is a demonstration of your commitment to improving cardiovascular health of your patients in your agencies. So great job to both of you. That's excellent. Now going back to what I would said about measure rates and improvement, it's hard to expect improvement without some action. So one action that you can take is to push your data in a positive direction by downloading and using any of the many tools and resources in our cardiovascular BPIPs. Misty Kevich will be along later to tell you more about them and, and the latest in the educational resources that we have. So this brings me to this month's challenge. I'd like everyone who has submitted data to really study your HHCDR report and start to incorporate some of those wonderful BPIP tools that we have for you begin tracking improvement. 
you can see how you're doing and get an idea of what helps, what doesn't work so well, and on which areas you really need to focus. Begin using the registry to help you set and meet some goals for improvement. This is how the registry works. You give some data and then you get back some ideas and an and, and idea of how you're doing and then you can actually see things improving. I also wanted to remind everyone, if you've submitted all six months of data and are ready for milestone four, that's the assessment of data milestone, uh, HHQI will be contacting you and saying, you've submitted your data, would you like to do this assessment of data with us? And Cindy will have more information about that later on, or if you have any questions, you can always contact us. So speaking of milestones, here is a quick poll question, I think. There it is. So it's where along the road to cardiovascular health improvement is your agency currently? Are you at milestones one, two, three, or four? And we know nobody can be beyond four because it just hasn't happened yet. <laughs> So go ahead and pick that or choose your, your milestone. And while you're doing that, I will quickly review some important HHCDR dates to remember. The March data became available for submission last Friday, the 15th, it will, the 14th, sorry, and it will close out the 15th. So let me say that again so it's clear. Data becomes available on the 15th and it closes on the 14th. I am so sorry, I've gotten myself all tongue-tied. So one thing that you can do is access these slides on our website, and this is a great slide to use as reference. I actually printed it out and hung it up and am able to look each month and see, okay, the data is gonna be closed on the 14th and new data is up on the 15th, and it's just kind of a nice handy reference to have, and you, you also have an idea of when your reports will become available. So sorry for my tongue tie there. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Cindy. Thanks, Stacey. We really appreciate that. And I hope everybody takes into consideration the challenge that Stacey gives to us every month. She's very good at motivating us along in this process. Now, one thing uh, I did want to share in regards to Milestone 4, as Stacey was saying, we have had a couple questions about this being an audit. If you're not familiar with Milestone 4, it's basically an assessment of the data reliability that has been inputted into the registry after you've submitted six months of data on any one or more topic areas. And what this is about is it's really quite simple. It snowballed into um, people thinking it's an audit and we're turning all of this over to CMS and things like that. No, 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 no. This is just simply you know how it is if you have a clinician who is coming in and starting with OASIS, and maybe you do this annually anyway, and you're looking at having somebody else assess the same patient and making sure that that OASIS item is being assessed and the data is being recorded for what the question is asking and that they're doing it accurately. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It's just are they answering what that question is asking? M2020 is a great example. Are they assessing the patient's management of the oral meds when they walk into the start of care visit or when they leave from the start of care visit because as you know, we all know that that can change quite a lot over that one to two hours start of care visit. So just making sure that the question is being answered correctly. Well, instead of having an extra person at your agency re-abstract for the HHDDR to ensure that everybody's doing the same thing, we just sit around at HHQI and try to think of what can we do to make things simpler. And one thing we could do here was like the registry. Instead of having 12,000 agencies out there trying to create a way to measure ABCS on their own, why don't we just create the registry instead of you having to decide what patient fits into what measure based on what ICD-9 code, we can take care of that. All you have to do is open the registry, answer a few questions, and you're done. Well, the same thing with this. Instead of you having to find a second person to re-abstract information to make sure it's accurate, we're just offering our services. What we would do is randomly pick out 30 episodes of care that you've already submitted or less, depending on how many you've submitted, let you know which patients those are, you send us the records, copies of them encrypted, we all that's taken care of, and we just abstract the same information blindly the same way you do. We don't look at your answers. 
we just do it based on the records you send, do a crude agreement, and then we send the information back to you. It does not go to CMS. It is not an audit. It's just a way of helping to make sure that you understand that you're abstracting correctly. We've talked from, to agencies around the country who have been abstracting incorrectly, and I know you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, she's talking about me. No, really, seriously, I'm not. There's many times that there's just been simple misunderstanding of the wording, so maybe someone hasn't had a chance to watch the HHDDR overview webinar and look at the data definitions and look at the FAQs and how it expands. It's very simple to do. Uh, to misunderstand something. So we're just trying to help you make sure that any changes that you make to your program and your process is based on accurate data. And again, I'm just using M2020, the oral med question, just because that's one I think we can all relate to who have been practicing in OASIS since 2010. When that changed, it's one that it's just the same thing, just making sure that answering the question and we're all answering it the same. So when you have abstracted six months of data, like Stacy mentioned, we'll reach out to you and just say this is an option if you want it, and we take it from there. Real simple, real easy, not looking at any drama. If at any point in time this data becomes part of a research and all this highfalutin stuff, that'll be years and years and years down the road. That's not what we're doing right now. All we're doing is just trying to help out so that you're not abstracting a couple of years' worth of data and only to find out that you were misunderstanding a question. Okay, enough about milestone four, sorry about that. And I will mention that, that um, I'm gonna go back here for a second. And this tool, the HHDDR Dates to Remember, Stacy's data analyst, and we don't uh, let her out very often. <laughs> and this is actually a tool that was recently posted in the past few days on the data resource site. So go ahead and grab it, print it, post it on your bulletin board, wherever it is that you sit if you're the ones abstracting, and this will give you an idea of the dates of when everything is due, and it'll help you keep track of when to expect that data to be shown in a report. All right, so now let's get to why you're really here today. It is to hear from our guest speakers, and we're very pleased to mention. With us today, we have Diane Arcilla, and Diane is very nice to join us from New Jersey today, and she's from the VNA of Somerset Hills. And then I will introduce the rest as we progress. So Diane, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share your experiences and lessons learned from uh, this entire project. Thank you, Cindy, and um, thank you for having me. I am um, calling in from uh, northern New Jersey. I am the Director of Quality Care Management here at the VNA of Somerset Hills, and I have um, STEP education and QI and a couple of other areas that um, I work with. We started inputting information into the uh, CardioLAN in July of 2014, and I have to say I was very hesitant at first about doing it. I thought that it would be a lot of work, and I did, you know, after a number of discussions with um, Judy Miller, um, I wound up agreeing that we would start with the aspirin um, area. I thought that would be the easiest for me to extract from the um, computer. We do have electronic health records, so it does make it easy for me to pull up med lists and um, to see the kind of care that the patients are getting. So I did look at the aspirin um, indicator for the first six months. And what I learned when I was going through it was that in a lot of the patients, aspirin or an equivalent was not necessarily ordered. And what I had decided to do about halfway into it was to send out information to the staff. I felt that there was a need for them to hear about this Million Hearts uh, campaign and what was going on with cardiovascular health. So I kind of summarized the best practice intervention package for them for the cardiovascular health part one, and that dealt with the aspirin as appropriate and uh, the blood pressure control. So after sending that out to them, I did notice um, an increase in the number of patients that had had aspirin um, ordered or something of the equivalent. So the nurses, they have responded well to that. And just in learning from this, I said that I would give out the information and then I'll come back to it again later on um, in a couple of months. So I moved on then to the blood pressure 
um, indicator. And I've been doing that one now for the last two months. So that now actually is a very easy one to extract from the, the record because you just go to the vital signs it asks you about the last blood pressure that was taken on the date of discharge. So that one has actually been a very easy one um, for me to do and we're doing well on that one. So I may do it for another month to finish out the quarter. And then I think I'm going to move on to the smoking one. I haven't gotten to the cholesterol one yet. I'm not sure that will be as easy to extract from the medical record. I'm not sure how much of that information we have. But I think with the electronic health record, that is a question that we do ask, and that should be something that's easy for me to pull out also. So, and Cindy, I'm glad you went over about the milestone four because that's where we're at, and I was having, um, uh, wondering about where we would go with that. But I do have to just say that this was something I was reluctant to do in the beginning, and it has actually been a great learning experience for me on what it takes to prevent these million heart attacks and strokes, and I think it's been great for the staff also. It's allowed them to become familiar with HHQI and the best practice intervention packages because we all see it in the office here, but how much of that actually gets out to the staff and what are they aware of that's happening? So it's opened my eyes to education that the staff has needed and um, also just areas that are just going to help us and the patients in general. So that's all I wanted to say for now, unless you know people have questions, I, um, I guess I'll answer them as they come in um, or I'll hand it back to you, Cindy, or on to Emily. I will take it just for a second, but I want to thank you for that because sharing this information, and I'll be honest with you, I work with agencies, and many of you on the call, I have probably worked with you throughout, and I don't know who was where, and I didn't realize, Diane, that you were at Milestone 4, so congratulations. That is a big <laughs> deal. There are not that many agencies in the country that are at Milestone 4 as we speak, so uh, yay, kudos. And so, yeah, with you or with anyone, as you start to have questions about Milestone 4, as we continue to progress through, just get in touch with us, and we're happy to walk you through the process, and um, I'm glad we are able to clear up some of that. All right, let's go ahead and on to our next speaker today. We have from us, from Hawaii, we have Emily Smith, and Emily is coming to us from Castle Home and Personal Care in, oh, I'm going to just mess it up. Kaneohe. Oh, how badly did I mess it up, Emily? Not too, not too bad. Kaneohe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For us, it's, the rest of us, most of us on the call today are looking at closing down our days, but Emily has come into the office early to join us today live. So thank you. We'll turn it yeah. over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Castle Home Care is probably not as large of an agency as uh, you just heard about the BNA. Uh, so it creates some different challenges when we decided to come on board with this project because we don't have the um, we don't have a, a QA department on site here. In September of 2013, we actually separated out as a hospital-based agency agency and became part of Western Health Resources, a uh, corporate entity of Adventist Health that's based in Roseville, California. So our QA program is really corporate-based. So we don't have a dedicated QA or PI staff locally. So the, the um, implementation or development of these programs really relies on myself and the clinical manager. So we, we went into this with a little bit of hesitation in terms of how much time commitment this would be. Would be. Um, but what we found is not as bad as we thought. So to, to begin the program, we decided to, to take on the two areas that would be most easily abstracted, and that's um, the, the aspirin and the blood pressure, that we have an electronic medical record as well, so we thought we could get that information fairly easily. Um, the cholesterol, that would have been a bigger challenge. We don't always have labs, as, what, as many of you know, so that would be more time commitment for us to find that information. And then smoking, we thought that we'd have the least ability to make change in that particular area. So we went with the blood pressure and aspirin, and it wasn't difficult uh, to give those smaller agencies like ourselves. And we admit about 125 patients a month, for those of you who are kind of trying to get an idea. It took us to do our 20 to 22 charts 
uh, we've only been on, on the program two months, by the way, about a half an hour. And one of us read through the chart, the other of us kind of read through the question. So we did this as a tag team, so we were able to get the abstraction done within a half an hour. Um, as I said, we've only been in the program two months, so we just got our first report actually yesterday or the day before the first report came out. What we did find is a couple of interesting things. Um, first of all, we misread the, the aspirin question and we were excluding um, anticoagulants that we shouldn't have. Um, even with that, when I looked at our data, for February, which was just posted, we still were in alliance. The compliance was the same as the um, total registry, even though we probably were better than that, given that we excluded a lot of patients um, that we shouldn't have. So we're going to see, we should see a real big switch in our data as we move forward. The second thing we kind of noticed, and we tried to track a little bit, for the patients with the blood, pre blood pressure um, treatment, those who didn't seem to have a, a um, follow-up plan or recommendations within the plan of care for blood pressure, they appear to be more rehab-focused. We have a lot of rehab-only cases, so we're going to have to take a closer look at that to see is that true, and then based on that, maybe make some changes, perhaps calling in more nursing into some of these cases that could have used the, the nurse for medication management or blood pressure management. So that was just... Um, uh, something we kind of sensed as we were reading through the records. And we started making note of that in the notes section of the uh, chart reviews. But at this point in time, we've not implemented any, uh, any changes because, as I said, we just got our data yesterday. So um, we'll just kind of move forward from here. But it is not a hard process to, walk, to, to go through. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to make a change in our community. This is cardiac disease is one of the highest readmission reasons in our community, so I think we can make a change. And that's all I have for now. Well, thanks, Emily, for that. And I did not remember that you had problems with the question. And I hope you didn't think I was talking about you. And those of you that are oh, no. on the line, when I talked about misunderstanding the question, is it, it's easily done, absolutely easily. And yeah, and I'm, it's wonderful to know that you were meeting the, um, you were still in the same level of compliance even though you misread the question. That's really interesting. Yeah. It will be good to see how it yeah. is once you're uh, including all those patients. That's right. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. All right. Well, I've received a note from our next presenter, Joy Owens. And unfortunately, Joy had a family emergency and just got home from the hospital as we speak. So if she joins us, that's fine. But, of course, we all understand how those things occur. Some of the comments that Joy had made that were, I felt very, would contribute nicely to today, today's discussion. Joy is in a particular interesting situation in that they have not, well, they have only just started abstracting in the past month or so. But what was interesting with her is she was able to see this entire process of the ADCS, the implementation of the cardiovascular care into the home health setting from a different perspective. She is part of an ACO, an accountable care organization, and for the past, I don't know how many months, she has been working with the physicians on what is called the PQRS, or the Physician's Reporting System. The Physician's Quality Reporting System is something that aligns directly. In fact, those are the measures that the HHQI measures are taken from directly. We call these the HHQI measures because we adapted them ever so slightly to the home health setting. And so as with copyrights, anytime you change any text, you want to rename it. But it, the concrete information of the age of the patients that qualify for which of the ABCSs and which of the medications, as Emily was just mentioning, qualify in place of aspirin, all of that information is exactly the same as what the physicians in the in the country are required to comply with. And if they do not comply with it, they receive monetary penalties. Now, that is not the case in home health. We have this luxury position. Ours is a voluntary process, but the physicians, our upstream providers, our referral sources are required or penalized to meet these exact same ABCS measures that we talk about here in the cardiovascular data registry. And Joy came into this as asking, how does this, this is exactly what I'm doing for the physicians, and that's how she stumbled onto the registry. And she is able to see the alignment of it and how the physicians are responding in regards to the 
cardiovascular registry and the encouragement she's receiving to make sure that the agency is working as part of that. So one of our next questions is asking about ACOs. Are you currently participating with an ACO? The polling question is yes or no, you're working on it or no. Now I know many of you have talked to us about being part of an ACO. We've heard phenomenal benefits of it, but we've also heard some different varying of opinions. So we'd like to hear that from you as well. And um, of course, I am not very good in substituting for Joy. She is a phenomenal, she has some great ideas and input. So like I said, if she does join us, we'll make sure to put her right on. But if not, hopefully we can invite her back and she'll agree to come back and talk to us another time. So as everybody is completing the second polling question, I'm gonna go ahead and let's move on to Misty Kavich, who's an RM project coordinator. And Misty's gonna share some of the newer features in the educational aspect. Now, as Misty is continuing on with this, go ahead and start submitting or continue submitting your questions in the Q&A box. And as soon as Misty is finished, we will unmute the lines and start hearing, and let's have discussion and communication in regards to what our speakers have talked about today. So Misty, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Cindy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, always afraid that my mute doesn't come off. So thank you. Um, I was very fascinated by both presenters already. I think there were some really great points. And, I'm, and I really kind of want to come back to what Stacy started us with too, about with your challenge of finding a tool. Um, so I know you're finishing up a poll question, but I'm going to throw out a chat question after we um, give you a little more time with your polling question too. But I want to tell you about what's new. We have lots of cardiovascular materials, as Stacy mentioned earlier. And then if you've participated on these calls, we've talked about a lot of the different resources. But as you're getting your data now, as you're really starting to dig and look at the several months or six months worth of data, you're starting to identify areas of need, and that's when you go and look for the resources. It's not the other way around. Cool resource, let's try it, and oh, but you know, see, let's see how it works with our data. You gotta look at your data first, figure out what the area is. So the first thing I do wanna let you know is as of May, beginning of May, our newest focus VPIP, uh, cardiovascular health for the at-risk populations. And for the at-risk populations, we looked at race and ethnicity because certain groups, especially African-American and Hispanic populations, are a little higher risk in a lot of different areas uh, for cardiovascular health. We took a look at gender differences. Uh, we focused in on some female as, as an aspect, but we also looked at some transgender um, issues that affect with some of the hormone therapy. We also took a look at higher risk regions, certain areas of the country. We know that the South and the Midwest are our highest regions. So if you live in those areas, um, they tend to have a higher obesity, decreased um, activity, and a higher rate of tobacco smoking usually, and also health literacy, which really goes across the whole gamut of our country. So we took a look, we wrote this package geared to the clinician, but also the leadership. And there are sections that you can pull some information out of there related to um, the cardiovascular, including therapy, um, some tips and ways that you can integrate this into even home health aid and social worker um, aspects. Okay, with that, we're gonna move on to our next slide. We added new, which was new for this phase of our campaign. And for you being cardiovascular, it's great because they're all focused on cardiovascular health. We have four video BPIPs that are up. They're about eight minutes each. Um, the first is, are you at risk for a heart attack or stroke? That's a patient video. So you're working on cardiovascular health. A really good tip here is to show this during a team meeting. Um, it can be downloaded onto laptops, tablets, and used in the home as an educational piece. It can be used to reinforce, to supplement the education that's already being provided by your nurses and your therapist. Very easy way for them to look at the risk factors, to identify that themselves as patients, 
as at risk. So great, great resource. Then we have the two lifestyle modifications, part one and two. They're clinician driven, um, but actually you could really, for a higher literacy level, could even use some of the video pieces or a section of the video with patients, but really good talking about general principles of the, life, the six lifestyle management uh, modifications. And the newest one that came out the beginning of the month is the clinician video on race and ethnicity and really highlighting the ethnic factors. I kind of gave you a real brief synopsis of a few of the areas, but this is a way that you could again use as a team meeting or send out the link um, for your um, staff to watch and be able to have dialogue and think about your populations that you serve and those that are at higher risk. Because if we can really reach our patients and emotionally tie them to the knowledge that they're at risk and we want to help reduce that risk, that's why the medication is to help bring your cholesterol down. That's why that aspirin is going to thin your blood enough to help reduce strokes or heart attacks. So uh, these, this is three clinician videos and one patient video that look forward to June because in June, the June 1st, we will have three new videos that will be posted. They are, and I didn't have this up right away, so I will let you know. They are, sorry, I have to find my list. All right, they, it is, I'm just not locating my list here at all. So in fact, it is ones related to um, diabetes and um, you know, blood pressure medications and um, heart disease. And I believe we have one on how to take uh, taking your own blood pressure. And I can't remember what the third one is without having my list. So I apologize for that. But do look for those. They're coming out the 1st of June. And they're all clinician videos and we have more coming in July and August. So next slide, please. With HHQI University, um, it is a free, it, it provides continuing education. If, you, if this is new to you, check it out. There is the link that's within the PowerPoint or just go to the education tab on HHQI and there is a, a sub tab that will take you to the university information. It's free and free continuing education for nursing. And the nursing CEs are approved through the ANCC that are accepted in almost every state. So if for nurses that are need continuing ed for their recertification, perfect. As well as it is a perfect way for you to share education to your clinicians without having to do training yourself. With HHQI, we create and help find and provide you lots of tools and resources and ways to educate. But the university was established so that we could help you one more step to help roll out some of the education. So you can see the topics that we have and the CE hours that are uh, um, available there. Um, so you can pick and choose or just really refer it to self-enrollment. Yeah, they will have to do a uh, short, um, they will need to enroll in both HHQI general campaign and here just because the resources are on the general campaign and um, can take the courses and get the free CEs immediately they'll get a certificate. For therapists and uh, therapists or social workers, they're still applicable. Um, the, some of your organizations will allow you to use certificates from another organization for, for some of your state credentialing or national credentialing. So that really is individual. We um, really are just providing the nursing CE specifically, but a lot of times the certificates will work for some states. And that's what I have, Cindy, and I can turn it right back to you. Well, thanks, Misty, we appreciate that. And that's one of the things we wanted to bring forward on these types of meetings and calls is to make sure that everyone is aware of what is new in HHQI? One of the benefits of joining this particular sharing learning action network is to be aware of what is going on in HHQI so that you can use it if it fits into your current lobby plan or your current plan. So with that, Shannon, if it's all right, we'll go ahead and open up the lines first. Take this as a warning. We're getting ready to unmute the line. So if you are on the phone, please mute your own line and don't put us on hold if you don't mind. And we'll go ahead and start and open to see if there are any questions. If we could, let's start with the eastern part of the country. 
Does anybody in the East have any comments or questions for our speakers today? All right. How about going with the central and western part of the country today? Oh, you guys are quiet. This is your day. This is your meeting. Well, we've had quite a few questions come in through the different chat feature in the Q&A. So those of you that are on the computer will go ahead and uh, read some of your questions. And these are addressed to Diane. And just give me one second. Okay, Diane, the first question is for you. Have you had a good response from your local practitioners and physicians with getting aspirin ordered? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, the person who's had the most dealings with the practitioners is our telehealth nurse. And how she has been choosing to handle it is um, she does a lot of coaching with the patients and educating the patients on it. So we are starting to see more orders for the aspirin. Specifically, though, then can I speak to how the physicians are responding to it? I can't point to any, you know, particular physicians and say, oh, they've really gone on board with this and now they're, you know, they're ordering the aspirin and they're looking at anybody who's high risk. Um, it's happening more through the patients and um, educating them that way. Well, that sounds great. And what about, let's go for the next I, question. Okay, this is Judy. I just want to follow up on that question. Um, with Diane, Judy Miller, New Jersey. Is it, are the um, physicians mostly cardiologists, Diane, or family practice, or a variety? It really, it's really um, straight across the board. You know, it's, I mean, okay. we have a lot of um, cardiologists that we deal with, but we're also dealing with a lot of just family practitioners, internists, all different. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, Judy, by the way. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Judy and Diane, this is your relationship. For those of you that are in the audience that aren't familiar, with Judy Miller is from the Quinn QIO in New Jersey, and Diane has been working with her. As many of you on the call today are working with your Quinns, that's the, the reason that the, they know each other. So just to understand the relationship. Now, Judy and Diane have been working together for a number of years, I know, but it's, um, it's the beauty of us in home health and healthcare. We are a pretty small community and get to know each other pretty well. All right, thanks for that. The next question is for Emily, and it's basically the same question. What kinds of responses have you had from the community in regards to asking for aspirin? Well, as I said, we have just gotten our data, so we haven't made any changes to our practice at this point in time, so I don't have a sense for how successful staff are or aren't at this point in time. Just too premature yet. Oh, well, it's totally understandable. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear from the rest of you out there today. I would be interested to know if you are hearing positive or any pushback. I've heard from a few people independently who have been very surprised at the positive response. Even though the patient wasn't supposed to be on aspirin, the fact that the home health agency reached out to the, clinic, to the physician and asked for it, it brought a whole new light to the fact that the physician kind of had an aha moment. It's like, oh, you're focusing on this as well. And that helps to kind of strengthen not only the relationship and the bonds between the agency and the physicians in the community, but it also lets the physicians know some of the focus of where your agency is. Take credit for the work you're doing. So we'll open that up for anyone that does have any input on that. While we're doing that, the next question is coming in and asking Diane, what type of clinical interactions are you finding for the blood pressure measure? Clinical interactions, you mean it's, oh, in the plans of care? Um, what I'm looking in for the clinical plans of care, I'm looking at if they actually specifically have a goal set up for high blood pressure or for the um, cardiovascular disease and whether or not the patient is on medication, and whether is there any interventions on teaching the patients about medications and uh, taking their blood pressure medication. 
and then looking at the blood pressure, that final blood pressure, just to see has it, is it within normal limits. That's, that sounds like a really good plan. That's um, a good way to do an overview, and that's where I think most people are, is either just starting this process or are able to join that and understand where you're coming from. Now, I know it's a quiet group today out there, but are any of you in the audience working on blood pressure? And if so, what are some of the findings that you have discovered? We're going to, the phone line is open, so go ahead and feel free, or you can put your comments in on the chat window. You're in some of you out there. Not sure if we're supposed to, but while we're waiting for this, I'll go ahead and mention that some of uh, what we see on the comments on the HHDDR side is that we're still seeing quite a few comments that in the comment section where you type it in after you've submitted your entry, finding that the patient is a therapy-only patient, and that's coming in in the comments. Now, I'm not tying that back to what you're entering, but I will assume that if it's a therapy-only patient, the reason you're writing that in is possibly that the patient doesn't have blood pressures or blood hypertension was not addressed. Remember, guys, even if a patient is therapy only, they are coming in and, well, they're not coming in, you're going to them, but they are having an interaction with a healthcare provider. And so even if a patient is a therapy only case, they should have blood pressures addressed and taken. So if that is something that is not going on in your agency, it's something you may want to consider looking into the rationale of why it's not being done and understanding that it is within the scope of practice. And we have a couple of different resources from the experts, from the American Association, excuse me, the American Physical Therapy Association, the APTA, who is, um, has recorded a couple of different webinars for us. One was here on this call in April last month, and one was on the underserved population webinar that was in January. And they were very specific in how to assist agency leaders and how to help therapists understand what the scope of practice was. All the while understanding that if a therapist has not, or anybody, if, even if, if anyone has not completed a skill, even though they were taught 10 to 15 years ago, if they have not accomplished or t um, addressed that skill in 10 years, they're probably not going to be very proficient in it. And so that's something else to keep in mind. If you do make sure that your policy, once you make sure that your policy does include that blood pressures will be assessed by all disciplines, including therapists, and if your therapists have not done this recently, that's something to make sure to work on some remediation and make sure that you're not asking them to do something they're not comfortable with. So it may take a little bit of a skills training and making sure it's part of your annual competencies because as we know, Five millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure has tremendous impact on the life expectancy and the quality of life and health of our patients. So the, even five millimeters, we want to make sure that our clinicians are accurately assessing that as well. And those tools and resources are available in the HHQIB tip to help with whatever you may need. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yes, Cindy, yes. it's Diane. I just want to comment on that also. When I was uh, first starting looking at the blood pressures, although they were always blood pressures because our clinicians, um, therapists, and nurses do the blood pressures, I wasn't always finding a care plan if it was just physical therapy in there for blood pressure specifically. So that is something that we, you know, we stopped and we looked at with the staff. And I know this has come up in the past also as, as far as is um, our medications uh, and teaching of medication side effects in their scope of practice. So as you said, you know, some of them are just not familiar or they haven't done it in a while and they're not comfortable with it. And we did have a speech therapist who we had to go over with him, how do you take a blood pressure? Because some people haven't done it, like you said, in a really long time. But it is in their scope of practice, so. It is, and I think some of the situations is of, again, I, you guys said it, I have this great position where I get to speak to agencies all over the country, and I know that across the board I talk to agencies who either are contracting out the therapy visits, so they're having to go through 
a therapy contracting agency and requiring that agency to require the therapist to take blood pressures. And all of this was addressed by um, Ken Miller and Bud Langham on those previous webinars. And I'm just mentioning that to those of you who are out there, that if you are in that situation and you are stuck because you have to think about what kind of quality of care is that patient receiving if they're not even getting a simple blood pressure check, and especially if they're receiving physical therapy because of the implications on the body when the patient is receiving therapy. How can you tell if they're getting ready to go down on you, if, they have, if they're getting ready to pass out, if you're not taking their blood pressures, especially your recent post-op patients? So it's great that you identified that, Diane, and were able to see that it was a need you're way ahead of the game. But again, we should have expected that. You've got six months of data in here, okay? <laughs> okay, there's a couple more questions coming in, and one is about asking if it's too late to join the registry, and that answer is absolutely not. It is never too late to join the registry. Episodes of care dating back to discharges in July of 2014 are available and waiting for each of you if you are a CMS reporting agency. Please feel free to join in at any point in time. And if you have any questions, definitely let us know. There is an HHGDR overview webinar that we want to encourage each of you to view, knowing that 37 minutes is a long time in home health, and that's the length of the webinar, but that's where the data definitions are reviewed. And we've heard from many agencies. They've watched it multiple times to get all the information. So we want to encourage you to do that. Now we have another question that has come in. And Emily, I think this is for you. It's great point about rehab-only patients. The question is, do your therapists review their own medications or use the nurses for the med review? Uh, see, right now, they're the nurses, we do not have nurses reviewing all their meds at this point in time, um, but that has come up as a point of discussion here as to whether or not there should be more nursing involvement. It becomes a resource issue, issue primarily. But at this point, they're doing their own review. The other piece we'd like to take a look at, along with this blood pressure, with this, this noted that the rehab staff are, seem to be the, those patients seem to be the ones that it wasn't addressed in their plan of care, is whether or not, if it wasn't addressed, whether the blood pressure was within normal limits or not. And we didn't, we didn't try to look at that connection, but I think we will moving forward. You know, was the blood pressure normal or not normal? And it wasn't, because that's another issue then. Mm -hmm. If education wasn't provided. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. You also yeah. mentioned something in talking about um, why you selected blood pressure based on your patient population. Well, there's a high, I think there's a high uh, incidence of cardiovascular disease in our community, and blood pressure just was an easy one to, to measure, and I think an easier one in home health to take action on. Um, as is the aspirin. Those two seem to be the easiest ones for us to have the biggest, I guess, the biggest bang for the buck for the time we had to commit. Mm -hmm. We could probably do the most work on those particular areas. Um, what about smoking? I didn't feel like smoking we could make a big impact, quite honestly, and I, and I really had a sense um, that in Hawaii there's a real big effort for uh, anti-smoking and there's a lot of bans on where you can smoke, and so I felt that, that was, we could have probably less of an impact on that in the long run given our short stay than doing the other two. And that's what I found really interesting when you mentioned that. It's really each of us knowing what our community what are the needs in our community? And you, only you as the agencies know this. You can decide, do you have more patients with hypertension? If so, address the blood pressure first. Or do you have the more of the cardiovascular wounds, non-healing arterial disorders? If that's the case, aspirin and cholesterol. And, of course, smoking goes across the board. But if you are, such as, as Emily is in Hawaii, and don't have that level of need for um, not that smoking is not important, but just as you were saying, the biggest bang for your buck. And it's common sense to go ahead and go with what areas do focus best in your community. We want to encourage each of you to reach out to your communities and to decide from there. I will tell you, for those of you that are new to the registry, most people find aspirin and or smoking to be the easiest measure. So if you're starting out and you're a little apprehensive, which I think everybody would be, I know I certainly would be, choose one of those two. And then depending on the navigation of the easiness of the navigation of your system and your EHRs, 
blood pressure is not too diff difficult to do either. So thanks for bringing that out. And Cindy, this is Misty. I'd like to throw in too. I think taking a look at the cardiovascular at risk population focus BPIP that just came out, if you're going to start looking at some of those populations that Emily just talked about, it's a good place. We break it down by each of the measures by d different um, race and uh, racial and ethnic groups, and you're absolutely right. Smoking is not a problem that's usually seen in the Asian and the um, Hawaiian problem or uh, population. So that would not, you would not get the biggest bang for your buck. But in retrospect then, in for um, the American Indian population, also in certain parts with the um, African American populations, that may be a bigger, uh, a, a way for you to make the biggest impact if you have a higher percentage. So again, looking at your makeup of your data reports to see um, your patients that are at risk. So that's all, thank you. No, thank you. All right, guys, we're gonna open the lines one more time for final questions from everyone. Does anybody have any final questions for your speakers today? All right, hearing none, we're going to go around and ask for final thoughts. And let's start with Stacy, our health data analyst. Stacy, do you have any final thoughts for the day before we close? Um, well, basically, I just want to reiterate my challenge to you know go ahead and, and start looking. And if um, if you're like some agencies and only have you know one or two months as directed, um, that's no problem. You know, just wait until you have enough data where you can start to see some trends and, and start to take a look at how things are going. Um, and definitely I want to reiterate that if you haven't started, it's not too late. Um, never think that it's too late and never think that it's something that you can't do. We're here to help you and um, we have a whole team. Each of us has our different parts and so whatever part you might be struggling with, um, we're happy to help and there are other agencies involved here on, on this webinar who are happy to interact and help each other. So um, definitely just give it a go and, and see what happens. But that's all I have. Thank you and we do like your challenges every, every month. How about Misty Kevis, final thoughts? I do, and I'm going to piggyback right off of uh, Stacy. So as you look at your challenge and you now have to think about a tool or a resource, re you have, as Stacy said, you have resources. You have your Quins to reach out to. You have us to reach out to. Let us help find you a couple tools that might serve you well for those that area of of where your data shows of need. And let us pick, help you pick out a few things, and then you determine what's valuable modify it so it meets your population. And that's it. Thank you. We'll go to Emily in Hawaii. Final thoughts? I, I just want to say uh, make use of your resources. I think that's a good point. I, we were in this project at the uh, encouragement of our QIO, uh, uh, Mark Mirabella at Mountain Pacific Health and, and Maggie Oki. I really appreciate their help and support. And so that's really been the uh, driver for us to get get this going and with just such, and actually we, we didn't put in a whole lot of time yet, yet we're already seeing where we have opportunities. So I think it's worth the time. Well, thank you for that. And Diane, wrap us up today out of Jersey. Out of Jersey. Um, I would say that if you're reluctant to start, you should just really give it a try. I was reluctant in the beginning and I have found it to be a great learning, learning experience. And if you want to try one, you don't need to do all four, just pick one, you know, pick the aspirin or pick the blood pressure. They really are the easiest ones to do. And it is not time consuming. And it is really beneficial in the end. Well, thanks for you guys for sharing that with us today. We really appreciate you joining us. Just a few up updates on HHQI, just to let you know the current counts. As of this morning, we are closing in on 13,000 participants. The question is who's going to be lucky, th the, who's going to make that 13,000 cross over that line? We have 12,920 representing 5,265 home health agencies. We do want to mention the May 2015 Agency of the Month is the Visiting Nurse Service of Northeastern New York. If you're not familiar with the Agency of the Month, that is an award that is given to any agency randomly selected from those who are currently 
at either the 20th percentile in ACH or better, or at the 80th percentile or better in oral med. There's a short little form to fill out to be included in the drawing. That's located on the front page of the HHQI website down at the center. You can just push on, uh, click on the Agency of the Month logo, and it will take you into the questionnaire. We do want to remind you on July, excuse me, June 11th is the next HHQI live chat. And for those of you in the Illinois area, all surrounding states, the next HHQI free hands-on workshop will be on July 17th. Please register. That is a limited, a space limited area. And we will be closing that when we cap out. So register early if you are in that area. We look forward to seeing you there. Our next Cardio Land meeting or webinar, as we are in here today, will be on June 18th from 2 to 3 Eastern. And you will receive your invitation on June 17th, the day before, just as you did today. It might be the morning of, but it's usually the day before. So we want to encourage everybody, if you're not already, if you're listening in on someone else's invitation, you're welcome. But at the same time, we want you to have your own. So please make sure to register for the Cardio Land so you'll receive your own invitation each month. So with that, again, please allow me the opportunity to say thank you so much to our guest presenters today. We really welcome the opportunity to share with you, the, your peers that are going through this process so that we want this session to be available to where you can learn from each other and share experiences just like Diane and Emily did here today. So with that in mind, all of us from HHQI would like to say to all of you, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Cindy, um, can you hear me? I can. Can you uh, pass the host ball back to me and we'll go into practice session? Well, that's a uh, presenter. Actually, if you could uh, right click over me and uh, make me the host.